Well, good morning again, church. It's a blessed day to be in the house of the Lord. And this morning, we once again open our Bibles to the final book of the Bible, the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Last week, we began to take a deep dive into the background of this glorious and this blessed book. We saw, as we looked through it, that the writer of the book of Revelation is John the Apostle. Now, this is the same apostle who wrote the Gospel of John. He also wrote the epistles, or the letters, of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. At this point in his life, John had been captured by the powers of Rome. Actually, they had two failed attempts to take his life. They wanted to try and kill him. He was boiled in a vat of oil, and he was forced to drink poison. But both times, John came out unharmed. And so Rome then decides, well, what are we going to do with this guy? He won't stop proclaiming the gospel no matter what we do to him. What can we do to him? Obviously, he won't die. We tried to boil him alive. We made him drink poison. None of it works. So what are we going to do? So they said, well, you know what? Let's just take him and exile him. There's this little rocky island that's about 13.18 miles in circumference. We're going to just, it's called Patmos. We're going to take him, we're just going to stick him on this island all by himself where he can do no harm. And they did this because Rome hated Christians. The Roman Empire absolutely hated Christians. They, Christians were seen as troublemakers. They were seen as, as rebels. They were actually seen as, re as enemies of the Roman gods. And because Christians would not worship these false gods, the Romans believed that the gods were bringing their wrath down for their refusal to bow down and obey to them. So anytime anything happened, if there was a famine, it's because of the Christians. If there was a, a wildfire, it was because of the Christians, or a drought, or whatever it was, everything got blamed on the Christians because they refused to bow down and worship the Roman gods. But not only were the Roman people fearful of Christians and completely disgusted by Christians, the Caesars or the emperors, they also absolutely detested Christians. And the reason why is because at this point in history, not only was there a pantheon, in other words, there was a whole bunch of different Roman gods and goddesses that people were supposed to worship, not only were they supposed to be worshipped, but the Caesars themselves, the emperors, had proclaimed that they were deity, that they were literally gods on earth, and they demanded your worship. They demanded that people would bow down on one knee and cry out to the hail Caesar, Caesar is Lord. That's what they were commanded to say. The Christians said, no, we won't do that. Instead of bowing their knee and saying Caesar is Lord, the Christians proclaimed, no, no, Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Therefore, Christians were persecuted, and persecuted mercilessly, by the way. Christianity was seen as illicit religio. That's, that's Latin. It means an illegal religion. It was seen as completely illegal. It was punishable. If you were found out to be a Christian, you could be imprisoned, you could be openly beat, you could be tortured, exiled, or even put to death. It was all illegal to do. And so it was into this world and into this culture of idol worship and debauchery that John receives the revelation. Revelation, if you remember, in the Greek is the word apocalypsis, and it's where we get the term apocalypse from. And what it means is the revealing or an unveiling. And because of the suffering and the persecution of believers, God the Father, in His great mercy and His great love and grace, He gives to His Son, Jesus, God the Son, this message, which is actually a message of hope and, uh, to His faithful and His beloved church. And so we get, the, we get the who, it was John. We get the where, it was on Patmos, and even we get the why. We understand now why this was written. Scripture and the early church fathers, by the way, and historians, they confirm that all the details we just talked about are absolutely accurate, 100% accurate and true. Today, though, we're going to look at the question of when was this written? When written? Now, if you are here last week, you might be thinking to yourself, now, wait a minute, didn't we just cover that last week? That was part of it that we talked about last week. Matter of fact, Pastor, you said that this took place during the reign of Caesar Domitian. And it was during the second of ten great persecutions that came upon the church. Now, I mean, wasn't this around what you said last week, 97, 98 A.D., when John wrote this? Well, that's one viewpoint that many, many Christians hold. But this is where we get into the theological debate on what's called eschatology. Remember, eschatology means 
the study of end times, study of end times, specifically end times prophecy. If you remember back a few weeks ago, we closed out our sermon series that was called What Do We Believe? where we looked at different areas, eight different areas that as, as Orthodox, born-again Christians, what should we believe? And so as we closed it out, the last sermon that I preached on that was America, Israel, and the end times, how we should see America as Christians, how we should see Israel, and how we should view the end times. And when we looked at it, when we got to the end times portion, I gave you three main views of eschatology or end times. The first was called the premillennial view. Now, this is often called a pre-tribulation or a pre-trib view. Then comes a post-millennial view. And then lastly, the third main one is called amillennial. We'll cover what those mean. But the reason why this is important, and it is important, to discuss the when. It's because what you believe in and the view that you hold to is going to influence exactly how you read and understand the book of Revelation. And we'll talk about that this morning. So last week, again, we briefly touched on what would be considered premillennial. In other words, pre-tribulation. Uh, this is a time frame where John would have wrote Revelation in what we call the later period, 97 to 98 AD, during the reign of Caesar Domitian. Now, for those of us that hold to this time frame, John's revelation is looking at all future events. In other words, things that haven't happened yet. Everything is yet to come. In this premillennial, pre-trib uh, theology, we find the rapture theology, we find the rise of the Antichrist, the seven-year tribulation period, followed by the 1,000-year millenn millennial reign of Jesus Christ here on earth. But we see all these events as they haven't happened yet. We see a building up too, but it hasn't happened yet. And I think that this is probably the most popular view of eschatology. I think a lot of people hold to this view, in spite, especially in the light of, anybody ever seen the Left Behind movies? Anybody ever seen those? Or maybe you've read the books Left Behind? Well, there's countless more books and movies that, that focus on the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. You may have seen some back in the 80s, late 70s, and uh, into the 90s and so on and so forth. But, you know, it almost seems that a lot of our theology, and not just dealing with the end times, but a lot of our Christian theology, it seems like, comes from movies and books. Yeah. It seems like it comes from movies and books. Sadly, a lot of times it seems to do so at the expense of this book, God's Word. Now, I do want to clarify this as we get into this this morning. I'm not going to tell you what to think. Nobody should tell you what to think. Remember what we talked about last week. We said that as we look into Scripture, we're going to let Scripture say what Scripture says plainly. We're just going to read it plainly and see what, what does Scripture say. And then we also we need to set aside any kind of preconceived notions. In other words, the movies we've seen, the books we've seen, we need to set all that aside. We need to be good Bereans. Remember whenever Paul, the Apostle Paul, in Acts 17, he goes to, to the Berean church and he starts preaching about Jesus and he's talking about the Scriptures. What do they do? As soon as he gets done talking, they go back and they look at the scrolls and they look at the Scriptures to see if what he's saying is true. So we'll be good Bereans. We'll let Scripture interpret Scripture for us. We're going to also be good detectives. We're going to look at all the clues that John has given us in Revelation. And then, of course, we'll let God's holy word tell us what to believe. So I'm not, I'm not going to tell you what to believe, and nobody should. Let God's word tell you what to believe. So again, what about the post-millennial view? What about the amillennial view? What do they believe? Because maybe your belief from reading the Bible falls into one of these camps. Well, post-millennialists, again, they, but they view John's revelation not taking place later in the 90s, in 90, uh, 97, 98, they see it taking place much sooner. In other words, they, they believe, post millennials believe, that John's revelation was written somewhere between 54 and 68 A.D. Now, this was during the reign of Nero, Caesar Nero. We talked about how wicked and evil that guy was. Matter of fact, they think that it was written before the destruction of the temple, and they look at Revelation where it talks of the Antichrist and the 666 is the number of the beast. They, they say this is actually code for Nero. And they can actually back it up with other scriptures and historical documents and things like that. So, why do they think that, though? Why do they think it was written much earlier? Well, let's take a look. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open your Bible to Revelation chapter 1. If you're not there yet, please go ahead and do so. Revelation 1. 
I want you to read and see for yourself what does the Word of God say. So Revelation, last book of the Bible, the final revelation of God, chapter 1. Amen when you're there. Amen. Amen. All right, so let's look at verses 1 to 3. Let's look what is written. It says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which, and here's an underline for you, must shortly take place. And he sent and he signified it by his angel to his servant John. So again, there's the heirs who wrote it, John. Who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it. And here's your next underline. For the time is near. Time is near. Did you see the two clues that John gave us? Number one, verse one, things which must shortly take place. And then we come to verse three, for the time is near. <laughs> now, hold your place in Revelation 1 and go to Revelation 22. Revelation 22 is the last chapter of Revelation. Let's look what John writes here. So Revelation 22 We'll be looking at verses 6 and 10. So Revelation 22, amen when you're there. Amen. amen. All right, so John is writing, and the angel is speaking to John, and it says this in, in verse 6 of 22, Then he said to me, speaking of the angel, These words are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants, look what it says, the things which must shortly take place. And now skip over to verse 10. Angel speaking again. And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Time is at hand. So just by a plain reading, a plain reading, what does the scripture, what does it say? Just read it plainly. Just by a plain reading, it would appear that this letter to the early church is to tell them about things that were getting ready to happen in their lifetime, something pretty soon. But a question could be argued, though. And here's, here's where I would have an argument about this soon and at hand. What does it mean by soon and at hand? Soon and at hand can be a generalization. Well, what do you mean? Well, what did Peter write in 2 Peter 3.8? He said this, but, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is a, as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So what does soon or, and at hand mean? Does it mean literally soon and at hand? Or is this more allegorical and it's more of a generalization and saying it's, it's going to happen, but in, a, in the Lord's view, a thousand years can be like one day. So that could be pretty soon. So where do we get soon and close at hand, or about to take place. So then that may leave you thinking, well, great, so now we're back where we started from. So is there another option then? Premillennial, postmillennial. Later, things yet to happen. Postmillennial, things that have already happened. Well, there's also the amillennial view, which, by the way, is rejected by most, not all, but most Christians. The amillennial view holds that there is, there is no such a thing as a thousand-year reign of Christ. And all the prophecies that are in Revelation, they're just spiritual, and they're not meant to be taken literally. That's the amillennial view. I personally believe that there is another option, though. I believe, or at least I think, that this could be, in Revelation, another example of what we call the near and far prophecies that we've looked at. Remember back to Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18. Moses is giving instructions for the children of Israel. One of the most important instructions that he gives is how to determine is a prophet really a prophet of God? Because there's anybody who can come up to you and say, the Lord spoke to me and said this. And so Moses says, well, here's a test. I'm going to give you a test that you can give to determine if a prophet is truly of God. So hold your place here in Revelation. Let's go back to Deuteronomy 18. and let's look at the test that Moses gives. So Deuteronomy, this is the uh, last book of the Torah, the five books in the beginning. You have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Then you come to Deuteronomy, and we'll find the test in Deuteronomy 18. So Deuteronomy 18, amen when you're there. Amen. Right, Deuteronomy 18. Starting at verse number 20, here's the test. 
Moses is writing, he says, but the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, so this is, this is God speaking through the prophet Moses, the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which Yahweh the Lord has not spoken? Well, when a prophet speaks in the name of Yahweh the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, this is the thing which Yahweh has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. So basically what God is saying is if the prophet says, Thus says the Lord, God spoke to me and told me this is going to happen, and it doesn't happen, they're a false prophet. And you need to stone them, by the way. You need to kill them. So here again, Moses writes that what a prophet predicts does not come to pass. He's a false prophet, and that's worthy of death. Now, many things the prophets would prophesy were to take place hundreds, if not thousands of years out into the future. Especially when we think about the Messianic prophecies, over 300 Messianic prophecies that we find from Genesis all through the Old Testament. So then, that begs the question, how could the people then know if what the prophet spoke was true? I mean, wouldn't it be easy to say, and I'm going to tell you, this is what's going to happen in the future, but it's going to be about 150 years from now. None of us will be alive. You just got to trust me on it. I mean, nobody's going to be alive hundreds of years and definitely not thousands of years later. Well, what would happen is God would give that prophet what's called a near prophecy. Yes. Something that mirrors the far prophecy or is tagged along with the far prophecy that would come to pass in a relatively short time span. And this prophecy would then validify the other prophecy. It would say his word. So, in other words, he'd say, this is going to happen in the future, but this is going to happen in your lifetime, and then that happens. So now since we know this happened, we can then rest assured that that's going to happen because this prophecy did come true. I want to give you an example of that. So you're in Deuteronomy now. We're going to stay in the Old Testament for a moment. Let's go to the book of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah. So you just want to fast forward. We'll get into the prophets. So you'll go and find the book of Isaiah. If you know where Psalms is at, then you go to Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the Song of Solomon, and then you'll find yourself right in the book of Isaiah, and we'll be looking at chapter 7 of Isaiah. Chapter 7 of Isaiah. Amen when you're there. Amen. 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 Now, this is a very famous portion of prophecy, Isaiah being a prophet of God. This is where we get the Emmanuel prophecy. So let's look at Isaiah 7, start at verse number 10. We're going to be looking at 7 verses, 10 to 17. Isaiah writes, Moreover, the Lord, remember it's all capital, this is Yahweh, says, Moreover, Yahweh spoke again to Ahaz, the king, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from Yahweh, your God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask nor will I test the Lord, nor, nor will I test Yahweh. But then he said, hear, o, hear now, this is Isaiah speaking, hear now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Curds and honey he shall eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both her kings. The Lord Yahweh will bring the king of Assyria upon you and your people and your father's house days that have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah. So what's going on here? Well, here, the Lord Yahweh is speaking through the prophet Isaiah. He's speaking directly to King Ahaz. And God tells Ahaz, he says, listen, you're not really believing. Ask a sign. Ask anything. But Ahaz refuses. He's got fear and reverence for God. He says, no, no, I, I, I don't want to do that. 
And so then the prophet turns to speak not only to Ahaz, then he turns to address the entire house of David. In other words, he's speaking to Israel now as a whole, Israel of Judah. Here's the faraway prophecy for all of Israel, for all of Judah, pointing to Jesus the Messiah. He says, behold, and that just means pay attention, listen to what I'm about to tell you. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. That's the far prophecy. Something that's going to happen amazing. A virgin is going to give birth. But then history records that this is written 700 years before the birth of Christ. 700 years Isaiah makes this prophecy. So then how do we know that this is going to take place? I mean, nobody's going to be around 700 years later. So what does God do? God continues to speak through the prophet. And then he switches now from the Messiah to Isaiah's son. So verses 15 to 17 is talking about Isaiah himself, his son. Verses 15 through 17. Curds and honey he shall eat, that he may know to refuse the evil, choose the good. For before the child, this is Isaiah's child, shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good. The land that you dread... This is speaking of Assyria, will be forsaken by both her kings. The Lord will bring the king of Assyria upon you and your people and your father's house, days that you have that have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah. So how do we know that this now is speaking about Isaiah's son? Well, I'm glad you asked. Look at chapter 8. It's right over here. Look at verses 1 to 4. So in chapter 8 of Isaiah, verses 1 to 4, Isaiah writes, Moreover, the Lord Yahweh said to me, Take a large scroll, write on it with a man's pen concerning Meher, Shalel, Hushbaz, and I will take for myself faithful witnesses to record Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Jeberechiah. Then I went to the prophetess. The prophetess was Isaiah's wife. That's what she was called in there. He was a prophet. She was a prophetess. And she conceived and bore a son. Then Yahweh the Lord said to me, Call his name Meher Shalel Hashbaz, for before the child shall have knowledge to cry, My father and my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be taken away before the king of Assyria. So chapter 8 connects with chapter 7, specifically in this Emmanuel prophecy. So this is the dual prophecy. The near is Isaiah's son. By the way, the prophecy of Isaiah's son in Assyria coming in, that happened within three years of him giving this prophecy. So what are we left with now? If this came true and it was predicted just three years, now we can believe the one that's 700 years out. Because God does not lie. But that's just one example. The book of Daniel records so many near and far prophecies concerning, he talked about the rise and fall of Babylon. He talked about the rise and fall of the Medo-Persian Empire. And then he saw the Greek Empire came in with Alexander the Great. And then he saw, well, uh, he saw Rome come in. And then ultimately, he saw the rise of the Antichrist. The coming Antichrist, who, by the way, would personify all the evil rulers of each empire. The Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Greek, and the Romans. He saw the, the rulers of those being rolled into one in the Antichrist. And we looked at that in our study of Daniel. And ultimately, though, that Antichrist will be powered by Satan himself. So when we shift our focus now, let's leave Isaiah, and we shift our focus back to Revelation. That's how I view it. I view Revelation as a near and a far prophecy. If the post millennialist view is correct, and that everything that we're about to read as we study through Revelation is pointing to Nero, is pointing to the fall of Jerusalem and the temple, and, and these things are about to happen in their lifetime, I believe it still points to the faraway prophecy of the coming Antichrist and the Great Tribulation period. I think that what's happening in Revelation at the post millennialists are right. It was written at an earlier time during Nero, and you've seen all these things happen. I think it's a foreshadowing, like a, a mirror, if you will, of what's going to happen in the future. Exact same events. But I want to give you another reason why I personally reject the post millennial view, and that's this. The writers, if you, if you ever have questions, by the way, there's a great resource you can go to called gotquestions.org. It's a Christian-run website for Christians that have, Christian, uh, have questions. So it's a great resource, but gotquestions.org, 
they write about the post-millennial view and they explain that post-millennialists believe that Jesus Christ will return after a period of time, not a thousand years. They see that as not literal a thousand years, but like just a thousand years. It's, it's a long time. They believe in this view that Jesus is going to return after Christians, the church, not Jesus Christ himself, but after the church, Christians have established the kingdom of God on the earth. In other words, all the Christian church will take up the mantle, the commission, they'll go out, they'll share the gospel, and the whole world will become better and better with the whole world eventually becoming Christian. And they believe that after that happens, then Jesus is going to come back. So that's the post-millennial view. It's going to be the church that's going to go into the world and it's going to set up the kingdom of God and then Jesus returns. They also don't hold to a literal method of interpreting unfulfilled script prophecy. They see a lot of the prophecies as more allegorical and not literal. But here's my problem with this. The problem with that is reality. Someone asks you a question and you guys give me a response. Is the world getting better or worse? Worse. It's getting worse when you agree. If you don't believe that, you haven't been watching the news. How about this? Is the world becoming more or less Christian? Less. less. Absolutely. Matter of fact, we see Christianity getting pushed to the outside, to the outskirts. And it's almost like it's about to become like it was back in the days of Rome, an illicit religio, an illegal religion. We talked about it in our prayer time. 26-year-old man openly preaching the gospel on the street. Somebody comes up and shoots him in the head. You know, if you, if you believe the world is getting better and the world's becoming more Christian, then I think you've got to be in a fantasy land at this point in time, a dream world. To think that our world and our culture is getting more godly. In fact, I see the world is growing more evil and darker and more perverse. I mean, you think about when you were a child, the things that you would see on TV or on the radio and you would hear. And it would give more glory to God. And, and the, good, the good guys always won and there was a sense of morality. But now you watch even what's deemed a child's program or uh, programming suitable for children. And all you find is rampant homosexuality, transgenderism. Uh, there's even a cartoon that Disney's about to come out with. It's, uh, it's actually it comes from another country. They're doing a remake of it where it has to do with Satan's daughter and things like this. Disney Channel. So no, our world is not becoming better. It's not becoming more Christian. I think it's just like Romans 1 describes. And so no, I, I, I cannot hold the post-millennial view for that one reason alone. Therefore, I personally hold to a premillennial view. But don't, don't say, well, then that's what I believe too. No, no. Do your research. Do your research. And again, I don't want you to misunderstand me. If you happen to be a post-millennialist or even an amillennialist when it comes to your view of history and revelation, that is not heresy. So if you have a family member, you have a friend that says, well, I don't believe in the pre-millennial, pre-tribulation rapture and all that. Okay, great. Because both sides can use Scripture to defend Scripture. I think that this is an opportunity for us to show love and grace and charity and to get into debate with one another. What it should force you to do is to research and go into the scriptures and find out what's true. Don't say, well, I watched Tim LaHaye's Left Behind, so that's why I believe that's not scripture. That's something a man wrote and came up with. So don't just write your friend or family member off as being a heretic for believing differently than you do about end times. That's not a salvation issue. It should be an opportunity. This is great. We can talk about it. We can debate. We can go to the scriptures and read and pray together. So it should be a great opportunity. But I want to shift gears and give you an outline of the book of Revelation. We're going to just completely shift gears. I want to give you, so if you're a note taker, I'm going to give you an outline of the book of Revelation. This is how we'll close out today. The entire book of Revelation can be divided into three sections. That's it. Three sections. And I'm going to show you this. So if you have your Bible, turn back to the book of Revelation, and I'll actually show you how you can divide the, the up into three sections. So Revelation chapter 1, verse number 9, uh, 19, excuse me, verse number, Revelation verse number 1, 19, gives us the outline of the entire book of Revelation. So Revelation 1, 19, amen when you're there. Amen. All right, let's look what it says. Revelation 1, 19. This is, is, and by the way, your letters may be in red. That just denotes that this is Jesus speaking now. And Jesus says, 
Write the things which you have seen, the things which are, the things which will take place after this. So how do we break up Revelation? Three ways. Here's your first note if you're a note taker. First off, John is to write, number one, the things which you have seen. So this is going to cover chapter one of Revelation, specifically verses nine to 20. So the things which you have seen is chapter one of Revelation. Here Jesus is seen with his bride, the church, and he's seen not only with the church, but in the church. He's seen in this section as the glorified and sovereign, risen and alive God and Savior in this section. And his message to the church as a whole, that in the midst of persecution, in the midst of terrible times, for God's people, Jesus is in and with his church. So that's the first part. Chapter 1, the things which you have seen. Number 2, the second thing John is to write. He says, write the things which are. That means the things which are now, currently going on in John's day. This covers chapters 2 and chapter 3. Chapter 2 and chapter 3 are the things which are now for John. He, again, here we find personal letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor. Remember, Asia Minor is, is modern-day Turkey. So if you're looking at a world map and you see Turkey, know that that's what they're talking about in the Bible when they say Asia Minor. It's Turkey. And in this section, Jesus is speaking directly to his churches. And he has a pattern to the address that he makes to the churches. First, there's a, condom, uh, a commendation, then there's a rebuke, and then there's an exhortation. So in this subsection, the things which are, Jesus says, number one, I want you to be encouraged by my presence. I'm with you. The second thing that he says to the churches, repent of the things that are wrong with you and your church. And the third thing, he says, no, this, that he will reward those who obey and for those who overcome. In other words, those who are victorious in his name. They don't fall away when things get hard. They don't turn and reject Christ. He says, for those that stay strong in the faith, those who are victorious in my name, you will be rewarded. So that's a little subsection in part two, the letters of the churches. Be encouraged by my presence, knowing that I'm with you. Repent of the things that are wrong and know that if you are obedient and that you stay and you overcome, you will be rewarded. And then he follows this up with the exhortation to pay attention. Pay attention, he says. He tells the church, don't just listen, but really and truly hear what he's saying. He says it by saying, he who has an ear to hear, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And church, I believe that we today as Christ's church, we need ears to hear, amen? amen? We need to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church today. We need to really pay attention, and then wholeheartedly apply the lessons we learn. Amen? Amen? So we don't just hear, but really hear. Don't just listen, but listen. God's Word doesn't just speak to speak, by the way. You know, my dad would tell me that growing up. He'd give me a lecture, and then halfway through, my mind would just kind of trail off. And he'd be like, look, I'm not talking just to be talking to you. So he'd tell me, right? He may not have said it like that, but that's how I heard it. But um, So God's Word doesn't just speak to speak. God expects his people to hear and to be obedient and to actually do the things that he commands. And by the way, God doesn't ask us to do anything. He's king of king and lord of lords. He commands his followers to do what he says. And guess what? He expects us to obey and to do. Matter of fact, Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, listen to what he said. And imagine he's saying this, he's standing in front of you today. And he says this, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? Church, that's a question that we all have to ask ourselves because God's word asks that of us. I tell you to love and to forgive. Do you love and forgive? I tell you to go out and to proclaim the gospel of the Great Commission and to make disciples. Do you go and do that? Do you love? Do you show grace? Do you show mercy the way I've shown you mercy? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? So that's a question we need to all ask ourselves. And that's part of that, having ears to hear. Let them hear. And then lastly, the third thing that John is to write, this is the third section of Revelation. So we had first, John, write the things which you've seen. These are past. 
chapter 1. Write the things which are. That was number 2. This is the letters to the churches, chapters 2 and 3. And then the things which will take place after this. This final section is the largest, and it covers chapters 4 to 22. And it's for the generations of the early church, all the way to the second coming of Jesus Christ. I want you to write at the church now, so that way the church in the future, so Franklinville Wesleyan Church, in the year 2023, can know what's going to happen. In this section, we find that God is going to judge those who persecute the church. You don't think God knows who shot that young man this week? He knows. And if that young man, and if that person that did it does not repent and get right with the Lord, he will answer for that. So God is going to judge. We see this in this final section, chapters 4 to 22. God will judge those who persecute the church, those who are part of the unbelieving, who, those who are rebellious toward God today. This section is about God's righteous and just judgment upon sinful humanity. You know, there... Never, there has never been and there never will be a worse time for humanity as when God himself removes his sustaining and protective hand from the world. And that's what he does during the tribulation. Right now, and I've mentioned it before, as bad and as evil and as wicked as we see the world, it is nothing compared to the tribulation. Because right now, God, the Holy Spirit, is sustaining the world. He's actually restraining the evil hearts of men. So even if you think the most evil person you can think of, maybe Adolf Hitler, the Holy Spirit was still restraining him from doing everything that he wanted to do. But during the tribulation, and we'll see it when we look at the Scriptures, God will remove that restraining hand. He's going to, going to turn mankind over to do whatever they want to do. So there will never be and never has been a worse time for humanity than the tribulation. And even though this is going to be a terrible time, because not only will man be doing wicked and horrible things, but at the same time, God will be raining down His wrath upon the world as well. So as we... Even though this will be a terrible and a horrifying time as we read through Revelation, you know, we still see God's mercy. We still see God's grace throughout all this. As He removes the veil from the eyes of the Jews, they will finally see and confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They will finally see and confess that He is the long-awaited Messiah, that He is Emmanuel, God with us. They will say that He is Yeshua, Yahweh saves. And during all this, Jesus will still save people. There will still be people saved through the tribulation. But you know, you know what the sad part is? For the people to get saved through the tribulation, they didn't have to wait. They didn't have to endure all the horrors that are that's coming upon the world. They didn't have to do it. They didn't, they, for many, though, it's going to take something like the Great Tribulation, the wrath of God, and all the horrors that it brings to finally crush their hearts of stone and get them to a place of genuine repentance. For some, it's going to take that. But friends, here's the good news. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Today. This day. You don't have to wait. You don't have to suffer through the coming tribulation. You can be truly saved and redeemed and born again today, this day. And if the talk of what's to come scares you, good. Let fear do its good job. Fear is a good thing. Fear says that when you're about to jump out of the airplane, put on a parachute so you don't plummet to your death. Fear says look both ways before you cross the street. Fear is a good thing. Fear is your friend. Fear can drive you to Jesus and help you see your need for a Savior. You see, because not only are we saved from hell, we're also saved from the wrath of God. So fear is your friend. And friends, church, our hope is in Christ alone. So won't you come to Him? Won't you come to Him today and not wait? Today, with one nail-pierced hand, he holds back the wrath to come. He's holding back God's wrath. But with that other nail-pierced hand, he holds it out to you in reconciliation today. He says, take my hand. Let me pull you up and out. Let me redeem you today. Let's be friends today and not enemies. Let's be reconciled to one another because one day, both of those hands, the outstretched hand and the hand that holds back his wrath, one day, both hands will drop. 
and there'll be nothing but wrath to come. Nothing but wrath and judgment. And church, that's not fear tactics. It's reality. It's truth that I'm speaking to you today. Truth and love. And I care for you. Whether you believe it or not. Revelation ultimately points to our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ, and that He will be victorious. And you can be a part of the winning team. Revelation is God's appeal to you to have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to you personally. And that message is this. Jesus is not only, is not only mighty to save, but He wants to save you. He wants to. He loves you. And He demonstrated by dying for you. If only you'll quit fighting him. If only you'll quit running from him. And then just surrender to him. He who has to e ears to hear, hear. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together today. And as we continue to pull back the layers of revelation, and we start our this digging deeper into it, Lord, we pray that we do have ears to hear today, that your spirit will speak loudly and, and clearly to us through your word because we know that's how you speak to us today. We will not hear a voice from heaven, but you speak to us through your written word. And so may your word do its good work in us today. And if there's anyone today, whether in this place or on the video watching later, if this person is not right with you, Lord, we pray that today your spirit will convict them of sin and of righteousness and of their need for a Savior and that they will quit running and quit fighting and that they will surrender to you so that you may save them. And Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that in Revelation we see that, Lord Jesus, you're going to be victorious over all of your enemies over those who would seek to persecute and harm your bride, the church. Because you love the church. You love your bride. You died for us. Help us, Lord, to live for you. So, Lord, we ask all of this in the mighty name of our risen Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus.